Blake changed the face of surfing and has long been lauded as one of the true pioneers and innovators in the sport. Although much has been written about him and his contributions, culminating in Gary Lynch's magisterial biography of him, Tom Blake, The Uncommon Journey of a Pioneer Waterman, published in 2001, very little work has been done on Tom Blake's Einsteinian philosophy. This is a shame, since though Blake was not formally educated, he never graduated high school due to the devastating influenza epidemic that swept the world in 1918 and 1919. He was an astute observer of nature and had a deep understanding of science and its implications on such perennial questions concerning ethics, God, and the goal of human life. While it is impractical and misleading to pigeonhole all surfers into a certain type, there are nevertheless some core elements that appear common across the surface. First and foremost is a love for the simple act of riding waves, whether short or long boarding, whether bodyboarding or body surfing, the list of wave riding vehicles is indeterminate. Second, and this is where philosophy plays a part. Surfers have tended to adopt a different kind of lifestyle than most, one that is invariably dependent on the ocean's ever-changing tides, moods and conditions. A dedicated surfer has to be open to fleeting moments and be ready within hours, if not minutes, to change course lest he or she miss out on a glassy session offshore winds or a peaking swell. In other words, a surfer has to be attuned to the present moment and keenly aware of how previous swells operated and of potential future trajectories, keeping in mind the fundamental physics of position and momentum. A surfer is a water physicist. If he or she is not, then riding a wave is not possible. Granted that the surfer in question may not know the mathematical equations underlying why ocean waves form, such as wave energy equals wind speed times wind duration times fetch distance, but experientially she must bodily adapt as if such laws were written in her muscular memory. Tom Blake was a scientist of surfing and, as such, took a very empirical approach to the subject. This led him to all sorts of remarkable innovations that allowed him more freedom in the ocean than what was thought possible. Within the limits of his time period, fiberglass, though invented as glass wool in the early 1930s, had only become commercially viable only much later. Tom Blake utilized what Stuart Kaufman has insightfully called the adjacent possible. Ever observant and with a remarkable eye for detail, Blake applied his extensive knowledge of the ocean and available building materials to create the hollow surf and paddleboard, waterproof camera housing, a prototypical sailboard, a surfboard with a built-in keel, skeg, fin, and such lifeguarding rescue devices as the torpedo buoy and rescue ring. Blake was also a champion swimmer and waterman, winning the swimming world record in the 10 mile open in 1922, the Pacific Coast surf riding in 1928, and the Catalina paddleboard race in 1932. But far beyond these accomplishments, Blake established a lifestyle around the sea that focused on what was ultimately important in life, perhaps best epitomized by his famous quip, Lesson the Overhead. Tom Blake lived a non-conventional life, married once for a short period, had no offspring, and never really settled down until his final years back in his state of birth, Wisconsin. Yet, this most remarkable of men, by pursuing an oceanic vision, has transformed the lives of millions, not merely by his words, but precisely how he chose to live. 
For surfers around the world today are, to some measure, the lineal descendants of Tom Blake's ideas. Encompassed as they were by a life fully lived, where the guiding principle is perhaps best summarized by an old Hawaiian proverb, never turn your back to the ocean. It is obvious in reading Voice of the Atom that Tom Blake was deeply influenced by Albert Einstein's theories, particularly his groundbreaking 1905 paper entitled Does the Inertia of a Body Depend Upon Its Energy Content? which explains the equivalence of mass and energy in the famous equation E equals mc squared. Later, Blake would summarize this law of physics simply as nature equals God, which he later permanently etched in sandstone overlooking his favorite bay. Interestingly, Blake's pantheism dovetails with the brilliant 17th century philosopher Baruch Spinoza, who argued in his magnum opus Ethics Demonstrated in Geometrical Order that there was one universal substance permeating throughout the universe, such that, although each particular thing be conditioned by another particular thing to exist in a given way, yet the force whereby each particular thing perseveres in existing follows from the eternal necessity of God's nature. Blake defines God's nature via atomic theory explaining that scientists now agree that the atom consists of many states of being. They have proved that while the mass and energy of the atom change identity, it does not disintegrate into nothing. While Tom Blake does employ religious language, particularly when talking about God, his definition of a supreme power is much more radical and heretical than what most Christians would accept. For Blake, there is an underlying unity behind nature, and he doesn't want to speak of a God that requires a belief in something transmundane. He approvingly quotes Emerson, who writes, Truth is the summit of being. And upon this, Blake adds, The atom, nature, God, and morality equal truth the first class way to go. Blake clearly champions a scientific way of thinking over naively believing in religious mythology, arguing that truth rather than myth should be established and, as I said before, computerized and available when needed. Dovetailing with his fellow religionists who believe in eternal life, Blake too suggests that we live eternally but it is not what one usually imagines. Instead of a bodily resurrection into heaven or a voyage into uncharted astral planes, Blake focuses on Einstein's theories concerning the interchangeability of matter and energy, where he exclaims, emphatically, yes, we do continue to exist by the compulsive laws of nature and God by changing back into the atom kingdom as a necessary and useful part of nature or God. When we die, we are not turned out of the universe, merely returned to the good earth, to our original atomic state, more peaceful, stable, and harmonious than stressful human state. Blake envisions this way of thinking as liberating and in his purview, he dovetails with such luminaries as Goethe, Emerson, Nikola Tesla, Carl Jung, Walt Whitman, Heraclitus, and Lao Tzu, among many others. For Blake, nature is not a problem as such, but the very essence of our existence and necessitates that we understand its vagaries. Look carefully enough and the deep mysteries of life unravel themselves since whatever the universe is, so are we. There is no duality in Blake's worldview, just confused misapprehensions by humans who are not observant and honest enough to confess the obviousness that surrounds us. 
Blake realizes that some may not agree with his positive spin concerning the afterlife, but he is nothing if not optimistic when he writes, Embrace the sublime and comforting concept of being reincarnated into a useful and grand eternal atomic state of being. Our true and rightful, and I might add, inevitable heritage, and where all is well. I knew I didn't want to be killed, and I figured all animals felt the same way. I have been a vegetarian since 1924. Tom Blake, The Uncommon Journey Today, being a vegetarian or a vegan is much more commonplace than it was in years past. This is due to a variety of influences, not the least of which is a growing awareness that eliminating red meat is a health-promoting practice. Thus, it is quite remarkable that Tom Blake decided to become a vegetarian in 1924, at the age of 22. At that time, there were very few people who abstained from meat, and those who did were often disparaged as strange health nuts, or worse, backward Hindus. It appears Blake was influenced by the burgeoning health movement that was growing at that time in Southern California. Recollects Blake. The San Fernando Valley had many fruit orchards and the owners would let you have all the fruit you could find after the pickers went through. It was at this time I was introduced to the personal health movement and became a vegetarian. I depended on my health for my swimming and lifeguard work. Although health was a primary concern for Blake's switch to a vegetarian diet, it also dovetailed with his overall ethic of increasing his circle of compassion to include other life forms. As Blake wrote, Israel's Judaism, India's Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, China's Confucianism, Christianity, in essence, carry the same theme, man's awareness of his unity with all things. Blake also saw his vegetarianism as dovetailing with what he took as the first real commandment of Judaism and Christianity, thou shalt not kill. He also emphasized the golden rule as taught by Christ, as well as the writings of the ancient philosophers and Hindus. The work of Eherat and Jackson also had their influence. Now, all those good teachings blend with the findings of the science of nutritionism, proving, in fact, that which man has known by instinct from time immortal. Although Blake doesn't mention Darwin or evolution in any length in his writings, it is clear that he understood what the theory portended and how life, temporary as it is, was a struggle for existence, especially where there is a scarcity of resources. But despite nature's ultimate indifference, Blake's philosophy is a very positive one, and he was willing to focus on a longer view of things, accepting in the process that man's former religious ideas have been superseded by a more accurate and robust scientific understanding, underlining that the old meaning of spiritualism died when Einstein identified energy as equivalent of mass. Then energy became real and replaced the mystery of spiritualism. Anything and everything has to be considered and dealt with in our daily lives. The ethic and moral of Jesus was compassion for all life. Blake was not an absolutist in his philosophy, since he clearly realized that compassion must be balanced by compulsion to survive. Because of this, one must follow certain instinctual laws while attempting to transcend our more animalistic tendencies. For Blake, this entails being willing to pay the price for certain errors of judgment and learning how to align oneself with the natural ebb and flow of differing circumstances. This earth, according to Blake, will never be a utopia, but we can optimize the best that it has to offer while minimizing those aspects that are damaging 
or harmful. In this regard, Blake is more in accord with Aldous Huxley's perennial philosophy that sees an undercurrent of truth and its applicability in almost all of the world's religions. Blake even holds a karmic view on thought and reaction, something that is common in such Eastern religions as Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism and Sikhism. As he employs science to support his contention that Einstein's cosmic energy field of matter is real, something that affects us. We cannot escape its reward or its sting. Much, but not all, depending on our own personal conduct and actions. Surely, sow and reap in kind, sooner or later, has ageless truth, is retroactive, and so the net result of nature equals God concept points up the absolute necessity of observing the rules of our species for survival and well-being. Blake lived a solitary existence and some, like Doc Ball, regarded him as a loner. Though he did keep to himself, Blake felt a kinship with all life. I found my greatest interest in swimming, surfing and camping, traveling around, and that it's a lonely life, that's true. But your friends are the trees and the forests and the birds and the animals and anything that you can see and the different people that you meet briefly. Every day was new. In the early days, we surfed purely for pleasure and health that we derived from it. Tom Blake, Interview, 1989. Once, when I was attending an NEH conference at the University of Hawaii in the summer of 1993, one of the professors commented about how surfers tend to view the world through a different lens. I asked, how so? He replied, they are more easygoing and less clock-conscious. To which I responded, Yeah, but surfers are very aware of time when it comes to a freshly arrived swell. This got me to thinking about how surfers live in general and how it evolved. While it is not accurate to claim that Tom Blake invented the surfer lifestyle, since anyone who loves riding waves must, by that very love, alter how they schedule their days, weeks and months, his life is nevertheless illustrative of how a dedicated surfer prioritizes his responsibilities. It was a typical cliché in Hollywood movies about surfers that they were viewed as beach bums who were more interested in partying than in securing a steady job. Indeed, a close analysis of the famous 1959 movie, Gidget, and the sappy 1964 movie, Ride the Wild Surf, reveals it to be a moral play about whether an adult male should get a steady job or simply follow the sun and surf. Blake had to break societal expectations to embark on the kind of life he chose since the cultural mores of his time were against those who wanted to live more freely without a typical nine-to-five job. Surfers who followed swells and not a punch clock were oftentimes regarded as bohemians or worse, simply loafers who contributed nothing to society. Tom Blake saw through the educational system with its Pavlovian grading system of pluses and demerits and felt strongly that a life revolving around the sea was a deeper and richer education. In a very pregnant note addressed to surf riders and swimmers, Blake provides a deep and pregnant critique of our schools. The knowledge you get in schools and colleges is second-hand. The wisdom and knowledge you get from the sea and waves and water is original and new and fitting. By all means, get some of this kind of education. 
Tom Blake also appears to have suffered some sort of traumatic experience when quite young, which led him to live a life on his own terms and not merely mimic his more conventional-minded peers. What exactly happened is unclear, and one can only speculate about what transformed his outlook. Blake clearly sees the ocean as his refuge and as his guide, and it was in its depths that he found his true religion, one not predicated upon prior religious authority, but by direct experience. For Blake, nature is God, and aligning one's lifestyle to it is the highest form of worship.